Hey, this is Zev Ash. You tuned in to the Entrepreneur Next Door podcast, and it's my pleasure to welcome Genevieve. She likes to call herself Jen, but uh, hey, at some point in my life, I used to be fluent in French. Those days are gone. I have <laughs> remembered some of it, but it's okay. Uh, Genevieve, bonjour. Welcome. Please tell us who you are without revealing any secrets, because I have some questions for you. Go for it. All right. So revealing more about myself without any secrets. Oh, that's a hard one. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here, Zev. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm so I'm so glad to hear that you used to be. I mean, I'm sure you're. So I speak four languages and I, I have faith that the ones that I'm not using are somewhere in my head, like just kind of hanging out. And that's a, yes. in the case that I would put myself in an environment where I would need them, then after a little while, would they would come back. So I'm, I'm, I think that that would be the same for, for French for you. Uh, so, you know, let's see if we can practice your French today. Um, all right. So yes, uh, I'm, I'm Jen, uh, French Canadian, and uh, I'm a productivity coach and a facilitator. I'm very passionate about uh, helping uh, busy, high achievers continue achieving what they love, but from a place of joy instead of a place of a place of stress. Um, and uh, I work with teams. I work with uh, leaders. And uh, yeah, that's it. That's what that. That's who I am in a nutshell. That's what I do. So, so four languages. So you're Canadian. So English, French. Yeah. Uh, we'll get we'll get to your Chinese. So that's number three. What's the uh, the fourth one? The Spanish. Spanish because I live in Spain. Yeah, and my husband is Spanish. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, everybody I know that and I that I like is in Spain or Barcelona or uh, Portugal. Um, oh yeah. So none of the wait, wait. I I was in Barcelona. I was going to say, but I've never been to Portugal. Uh, it's getting close. There's too many people that that I really like that are in Portugal. So time for yeah. me to get there. All yeah. Right, so. I'm going to call you by your French name because because of course we have to do the French thing. So Genevieve, Pepin, yes. Uh, when you were a kid in uh -huh. a, which part of Canada? Quebec. I'm from Quebec, Quebec. City. Yeah, French through okay. and through. Got it. So I ran into you when you were a teenager. Mm. What did you want to be when you grew up? Um, I wanted to be uh, somebody who had to express themselves creatively. I didn't have any like, you know, specific thing in mind, but I knew that I wanted to use my creativity. And um, yeah, and that got buried through being told that that was not serious. Mm -hmm. What? You won't make a living out of that. You should go into business or become an accountant or something. So like, study economy. Yeah. Yeah, that's all, all our parents tell us. And my parents yeah. wanted me to be an accountant. I said, are you crazy? Yeah. I'm going to walk around with a pencil in my top of my ear. That sounds really boring. So yeah. and no offense to accounts. Um, so that's a uh, great. So you can sing and you can and you play the ukulele. So when mm -hmm. you say creative, were you talking about music? What what does creativity mean to you when you were a teenager? Were you a singer? That's, that's a great. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I actually, when I was a teenager, the way that I expressed my creativity is that I was um, making my own clothing or I was uh, adjusting or, or uh, repurposing like clothing. So I was not, I love music, but my singing days came way later. In fact, like just a few years ago um, and same thing with comedy and acting and stuff like that. I was, I was into that when I was really, really young. But then I kind of became shy. And so the way that I was expressing my, my creativity was more through design at that time. Mm. Uh, I, I find it amazing you said that you used to be shy. It's, it's not that like the story, everybody who's outgoing and fun and gets on stage, not everybody, but a lot of them, a lot of people are actually introverts. They're shy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I guess it's part of the process of, dealing with it is you actually do the opposite you get on stage and you do the opposite of shy even though yeah. internally you were that so um I don't know who pushed you to that but you wind up going to school to be maybe you wanted to be a diplomat because you studied international relations mm -hmm. um you wind up with the trade mission in China and so mm -hmm. you learn Chinese for two years 
How, so how did you pick international? How did you wind up in China? Um, how I ended up in China. So I did the classic backpacking trip when I was 20. Did you do one of those? Like go backpacking around Europe? Uh, and I, I, uh, I did, did actually. Yeah. So I'm from Israel. And when, when you turn 18 in Israel, you go for a mandatory three-year service in the army. And yeah. We all look forward to do it. It's unlike other countries. We want to serve and protect our country. So between mm -hmm. high school and my scheduled uh, basic training, I did go into Europe and join a group of backpackers that left from London. And we backpacked all through England and mostly Scandinavia. It was an absolutely phenomenal time. Whoa. That's yeah. so... It, it was summertime? It was summertime, yeah. Summertime, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow, that's really cool. Um, yeah, we'd love to hear more about that. Uh, so, uh, um, yeah, the, the um, I went to backpack and then I went. To, I, I crashed on a friend's couch uh, for a little bit, and um, that she lived in Edinburgh, and I met a Chinese friend, and she was really. Um, I just was very curious about China. I was never really interested into it before, and it was just very, very far away from where I lived. So I got interested into this, um, and uh, I was just I got I just got really curious, and um, and I and when I went back to Canada to study, um, I uh, I looked for opportunities to go to China, got a scholarship, ended up studying Chinese for two years, uh, and then going back for internships and so on, and I worked there for for a few years as well in Shanghai. Yeah. So you said you your friend was in Edinburgh in Scotland. Yeah, that, that that's pretty wild because that that backpacking trip that I mentioned, there was a bunch yeah. of people, um, mostly young people from, I was 17 and a half close to, but they, they were like 18, 19, 20. Um, one of the people that, that was in my group was a very tall, uh, he was from Indonesia. He was very, very distinguished guy. He had long hair up to here. Uh, to me, he looked Chinese, but he was Indonesian. He was the son mm -hmm. of a prince, whatever. But he was with us. And wow. so we backpacked together. And when the tour was done after three weeks, we we became such good friends. And we said, you know, let's stick around in England. Let's 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 go to Scotland because it's a beautiful country. Yeah. Uh, and everywhere I went with him, uh, he was like the main attraction. It was like it was amazing. People just looked at him and especially women. It was just just like magnetized by this guy um you said edinburgh because that's him and i just went backpacking and went out to yeah. scotland it was a, so it's a beautiful place so somebody that that was on, on my podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago said about their uh asian experience is that when you go to one of these countries you feel like a baby again because oh. you you don't recognize anything. The, the language is different, right? You're completely helpless from, from a communication standpoint. But you went there and you could speak Chinese. So, so you were able to assimilate into the culture. Yes. Um, I mean, I, <laughs> when I got there, I didn't speak Chinese. So I didn't. I definitely had this experience. Also, I think it, it depends on where you are, right? For example, if you're in Shanghai, 26 million people, but there's at least 1 million expats. Or there was at that time at least 1 million expats. And people were used to seeing expats. I, where I studied Chinese, it was a city called Tianjin. It's not a small city, 11 million people at the time. Um but the, the the foreigner community was very small. And uh, so what the reason why I say that is because there was no way of getting around with English. <laughs> like, you know, so you, you had to dive into the discomfort of not being able to, to communicate or to, and at the time it, I had like paper dictionaries because now, I mean, Chinese is complex to look for in, in a paper dictionary, but at the time that's what we had and uh, looking for words and trying to communicate. Um, it's very disorienting. And I'm going to be honest, I, I, I loved it. Mm -hmm. I loved it um, because it had it, it, like all assumption expectations you could have of how things would be would be different and 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 it's so funny because as human beings 
you know, our brain is kind of looking for what's familiar. So we look to make associations, right? So I walk into a grocery store, I see bread, I said, oh, okay, that's bread. And I automatically assume it's going to taste exactly like the bread at home, right? Because that's what I know. And then I buy the bread, go home, and then I make a salami sandwich. And I realize, oh, hold on a minute, that bread is actually sweet. What? Right? And then you know, in the beginning, you get offended because like, how, why would they put sugar in bread and so on? But then that's just, yeah, because that's just what they would do. Like, you know, for that specific type of bread in that specific grocery store. Um, but then when, when you get used to that, then you, 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 you open up a lot of your mm-hmm. horizon. And uh, that's a very, that's a very interesting experience. Yeah, it's, and I would think that in, in that kind of an environment, if you're a creative person, it it really it it need it brings it up. You have to be creative to navigate a culture where you're sticking out, right? You don't look Chinese, and that's you don't speak thing. Chinese, yeah. And and you're different. So it was Peter Murphy that that we talked about. He moved to Chile, uh, mm. and he said, "Look, I, I'm he's over six feet tall, with blue eyes, and sp- he spoke Spanish, but Chilean Spanish apparently is very different." Um, and he said, listen, you're like, if you take a basketball player and you bring him to China, you can't miss him. Nobody could miss Peter in Chile. He was very tall and it was very obvious. So, um, I actually spent a lot of time preparing for these and I don't know if I got this right. You tell me, um, was it, was it your interaction and exposure to the expats where you identified people that were unhappy, frustrated, that led you towards coaching and and the track you're on today. I, I think that's, maybe I picked it up somewhere, but I don't know if it was true or not. So my, my next question is really, and you can answer the question, is when did you discover you wanted to be a coach? So that's a, such a great question. I I hadn't seen it like that. Um, So I I would say that, first of all, uh, the first time I I, I wasn't in, in, I I touched the the world of coaching was when I was a volunteer for Helpline that was specifically targeting expats. uh, That was called Lifeline at the time. Okay. Yep. And, um, And I mean, it was not coaching, but they were they trained us to be able to assist people, right? Where they would call and most people who would call were not really in distress, but some people were. And so we were, we needed to be ready. And, and that was a very interesting experience. And I remember one time where just by asking questions and by listening and by being there for somebody who was in, 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 in emotional crisis at the time, um, she was, it just completely changed her perspective of the situation. Um, and, um, and it really helped her. And she called back and she said like, thank you so much. You changed my life. And I was like, but I didn't do anything. I just asked you, where do you see yourself in two years? You know, like that was something very simple. Um, and that was, that was very interesting. And then years later, I, I went to a coaching workshop, not really knowing what to expect, um, and then I realized like, oh, what I used to do at that helpline was actually a little bit of coaching. Um, so I got interested into that. But really, for me, the passion behind coaching and the passion behind personal development is because my story includes multiple burnouts. I, um, I've i always been a high achiever, always wanted to um achieve 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 and create great things and and I'm not afraid of working hard and then I I was in an environment where I gave my all and I burned myself out I was like oh that's probably my boss and so I'm just going to change job mm-hmm. I changed job and everything was great still burned myself out. I was like oh, maybe it's a culture changed country changed background changed job changed everything and I thought like okay now I'm, I'm going to be fine and then I burned myself out again I was like hold on a minute like now I cannot point outside of me because there's nothing else. Like all, all the commonalities from previous situations have, are gone. The only common denominator is me. And so I had to look inside and I had to like, how do I actually, what role do I take in those situations? And that's mm-hmm. how I got really curious about 
the power of our thoughts and our mindset and, and, and how, um, and, and just the whole personal development world. Um, and that's what led me to that coaching workshop. That's mm. led me to, uh, what I'm doing today, but that, that was, a you know, when it comes from inside of you and you really see the, um, the, the power of, of working on yourself, then it, you know, it, it really helps to, to be passionate about helping others around that too. So, so you use the word burnout a few times. Mm -hmm. Tell me what, what it feels to be burnt out from your perspective. Yeah, that, that's a good, that's a good point from my perspective. Cause there's, you know, yeah. there's not a one way to, to experience that. Um, the way that I experience being burned out and that I, I recognized it is that, um, uh, first of all, I was completely, uh, you know, that drive that was driving me to do things. It was gone. I became cynical about that. You know, why, why would I work hard anymore? Right. Um, I felt like no matter, no matter how much effort I was putting, it was not leading me anywhere. Uh, I was extremely tired. Um, and I started also having some brain freeze, right? Some blanks. I, I was not being able to be creative anymore. I was, my brain was going in fight or flight super easily. Um, and uh, I was not being able, to, I was not able to see clearly in situations. I would, I would, my threshold was like very, very quick of feeling extremely low and not being able to move forward um, and not being able to, to, solve simple problems um and uh and yeah and that happened over and over again and and unfortunately also all the anxiety that that comes with that for me it, it, one of the coping mechanism that i that i used at the time was i had an eating disorder and that didn't didn't help and that that showed like that as well because that was a way for me to kind of feel mm -hmm. like i had a little bit of a, of control over my life which obviously is an illusion so at, at this point, I want to, I'm going to read your LinkedIn description. I want to jump into it. Uh, wellness through comedy and play, teams and leaders, performance, stress, team building, training, productivity, coaching, loves to laugh, get things done, and dogs. So um, you're an entrepreneur. This is, a, this is a show about entrepreneurship and what we can all learn from each one of my guests. And most businesses, I would say the majority of businesses always start when the founder, the person that started it had a personal frustration and they couldn't find relief anywhere else and said, okay, so I'm going to fix it in, in their own way. And so when I work with, with founders and business owners and entrepreneurs, um, my the first question I ask them all the time, and I would always preface it by saying it's a marketing question because I'm a marketing guy, and it's a really, really challenging question. But particularly in terms of what you do, I want to ask you that question. Mm -hmm. And the question is: so what problem does Genevieve Pepin? What problem are you solving? Right? Mm -hmm. Like, what is the, so the reason for your existence, so to speak, I don't want to go to the why thing because it's been beat up by too much, but for you, you, you went through it yourself. You got burnt out. Um, you probably to all of us, when we go through these kind of challenges, we look for solutions. You didn't find, or whatever you found was just same old, same old, whatever, right? You then pick a lane, and your lane is wellness through comedy. Mm -hmm. But what? So, what problem are you solving, right? So, why does why does the world need Genevieve Pepin, where there are probably thousands of books and YouTubes about motivation and leadership and finding joy and product? You know, it, you you jump into a tank filled with sharks. So, tell me, Genevieve, what problem were you solving? Yeah. The way that we approach performance is not working and is not sustainable, in my opinion, and in and, and the way that, you know, when I started coaching, I saw a lot of 
uh, of high achievers that just, again, had the same patterns that I used to have. Um, the problem I'm solving is unhealthy performance and then therefore leading to healthy performance. So how can we continue performing, but through joy in a way that is sustainable for us mentally and physically? Now, you said something that is interesting because that's the problem that I'm solving, meaning that you know the world is stressed, is anxious. We are a slave to our thoughts and our emotions, right? Technology is evolving at a rate and a speed that nobody can comprehend. And us humans, we're still here getting upset over an everyday thing because it's normal. We, you know, we have our experiences and our thoughts, but we're still here stuck believing our thoughts. We're still here stuck believing our imposter. We're still st here stuck believing our anxiety that tells us that if I say no to that Zoom meeting, somebody will think that I'm unprofessional, right? And for some people that keep them up at night. And when we take control and manage our mind, when we know ourselves and understand our drivers, then we can continue achieving great things, but not from a place of stress and anxiety, but from a place of joy. And so that's the problem I'm solving. Now, what does it have to do with comedy? And there's another thing. There's a lot of people who already do that. There's already a lot of people who talk about burnout, who talk about personal development and so on. In my personal opinion, and in what I've seen, it's... It's challenge. So change sucks. I hope I can use that language here. Is that all right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay. Change sucks. Change hurts. Your brain doesn't want to change. Your brain wants to stay in the familiar, right? So if it was only about reading that last book that would make you change, then you know there would not be a problem. But there's already all the information out there. Behavioral change is difficult for other reasons, and. I think that we don't necessarily want to change, even though we want the results. So my aim in bringing it in through comedy and play is to create an experience for the change to be smoother and for it to be more entertaining. So it's not so challenging anymore. So I'm going to try and interpret what you said. Um, okay. I think the the problem you're solving or or the lane you pick. Uh, comes from the fact that um, well, maybe we're just too damn serious and we don't take time to actually stop, step back and just enjoy the moment, right? So that sounds, again, there's nothing new because there's plenty of, of content on that topic. Yeah. But you connect it to the word performance, mm -hmm. right? And I think that for all of us, including you and me, who are coaches and entrepreneurs, there is a, a built-in pressure to always move forward, to always drive results. Mm -hmm. If you if you work for a company, I feel bad for you, right? And I'm sorry I'm saying it because I left that universe after 30 years and found I found true happiness by actually walking away at the worst time anybody could ever should ever walk away from a very successful, high-paying executive job where you put three kids through college, you have no debt, nothing, and now you walk away from that gold mine into zero income. And I've been doing it for 11 years, and I don't look back and regret it. It was the first 18, 20 months were brutal. And they were brutal because the universe as an entrepreneur, when you, what I say, disconnect from the mothership, when you're not part of a corporation, uh, when you're on your own and you go to zero income on day one, uh, is the, the pressure is tremendous and sleepless nights and not and stomach aches and depression and maybe I should go back and get a job which is not available anyway. All that stuff. So there is internal pressure to perform, which which is there all the time. And then if you work for someone. There is the additional pressure that you have to perform to keep your job. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's, and you work with, you work with you said with leaders. So these mm -hmm. are people who are either own companies or leaders inside a company, managers, executives, and you work with teams. Mm -hmm. And 
I, I, I like the fact that you approach it through comedy because I've, I've always been, I always loved humor. And my father was very funny. I guess I got some of his genes. And ever since I was a kid, everybody called me throughout my school years. He's the class clown. He makes us laugh. Uh, and so I can appreciate it, right? Yeah. So so maybe maybe what you the problem you're solving is um, we're just too damn serious, okay? Uh, it, it, we're just too damn serious. And the goals and the objectives and the metrics and the KPIs and all this other crap that everybody has feel that they have to live by, they will be there tomorrow. And we know that the minute we accomplish one goal, another one shows up right after that, right? So we're on this roller coaster of anxiety and and pressure that's because we feel we need to perform. You so so how do you get through this with comedy? So right? Now, now I'm I'm asking you to kind of use your experience and interaction with your clients. Um how does it work? Because people are, I know, I, listen, some people think I'm very funny, although I'm very serious right now. But I also find that when I crack a joke and I look at people's facial expression, uh, they're not that receptive most of the time, right? Is this the issue that you're fixing? Um. I think, okay, so I would say yes and no. I think that the, being too serious is a consequence of fear. And, and so how does comedy and play come into that? Well, first of all, play is, um, is, is, is an activity that creates a safe environment for us to fail. I mean, why do we why don't we want to fail? Why are we so serious? Why do you think people are so serious? I'm asking you. Be, because we are we are born from from the as, as soon as we're able to walk and talk, what we hear from our parents is follow the lane, do what you're told, right? And you'll have a great life. I'm I'm summarizing a quick thing, right? Mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. you know, yeah. my my mentor, the person I've been following for 30 years was Seth Godin. We'll always talk about the industrial era where yeah. people were sitting on assembly lines and they were taught to this is how you make this part. You show up for work every day. You do what you're told. You know what the problem is? The problem is the education system, at least in America. I don't know, uh, including Israel, who is one of the top, most highly rated education system. When you walk into the classroom, what you're being told from an early age is do your homework, color inside the lines get good grades and if you get good grades and you play sports and then you apply to college and how do you apply to college go volunteer and impress people that you did other things it's it's a template of bullshit uh -huh. that everybody gets pushed into right um i have a term that says because i've always been disruptive and and fought against the rules that if you follow the herd you're going to get slaughtered right so if you want the life that everybody else is like stamped on Okay, fine. Maybe you'll have a good job and make some money. But you know what? You go talk to all these people and they will tell you quietly, I'm miserable. I hate my life. Okay? So if you ask me, why are they so serious? Because we're still in, in it comes from home and it comes from the environment where you're supposed to be and act in a certain way and go to school and achieve to have a great life. But the piece that everybody tends to, to skip over is what have you sacrificed or what are you sacrificing for that that moving target of happiness the artificial happiness right so people are serious because i don't think they have a choice because they think they're supposed to do things uh the ones that that are able to achieve and be happy are the ones that break things the disruptors right and mm -hmm. they, you get in trouble for it i've gotten in trouble my entire corporate career for speaking my mind out for being passionate and not playing political games and sitting in a meeting and saying something that no one else would dare to say, right? And a lot of times it was funny, but there was always seriousness. Even in comedy, there's always seriousness, right? And, of course. And nobody, nobody liked what I had to say because it wasn't 
expected. It wasn't standard. So I think people are serious because they don't think they have a choice if they want to be successful. And they're wrong. I love that you say I don't they don't think they have a choice. This is a huge, this is a huge one right there. So what would happen if they would not be serious then? They would potentially not be successful. But but they will be happier. Right? No, no, I know, I know. I'm not saying that this is true. Yeah. I'm just saying, yeah. I'm just saying, so you know, we're talking about why, you know, we're just talking, right? About like why were people so serious? Because we believe that this is how we will be accepted by others. This is believe we believe that this is how we will succeed, right? This is what we believe that we're supposed to do in order to get to the holy grail of feeling like we finally get it and we're fine and and we're out of danger and you know like all of those survival things in our brain and that being ourselves or being playful and taking because again in being playful and funny it requires taking risks and uh being vulnerable right and this is more associated with this is not serious uh this would potentially not lead me to that result that mm -hmm. i want which is being successful right yeah so that's a, like that's what most cultures are right in environment in, in companies like you need to say the right thing you need to have the right ideas you need to be right 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 but yeah it's most companies also want creative and innovative people and those two things don't work together because a great idea is often the third or fifth iteration of a sucky idea right mm -hmm. so the playful element in including play in team activities or uh, in the culture um, helps create an environment where people feel safer to fail um, and feel safe to laugh and so on. And, and again, just if I tell you, be creative, be innovative. If you come from a background of, I need to have it right, mm -hmm. it's difficult. But when we enter this and we start with laughter, with play, with silliness, right? It opens up, it loosens us up a little bit and it create it, it creates safety in our body so that we're able to actually open up to a group or to, you know, the person we're talking to mm -hmm. so that we feel like we can actually take those risks and be ourselves a little bit more because most people, you know, most people like to laugh. Like, I mean, it's very rare that people say like, oh, laughing. I hate that. Right. It's just that again, we put that facade because we think that this is what will we, we'll bring success. Now, the same thing with humor and comedy when passing a message first of all it's more entertaining second of all nobody likes to be told what to do um and third again it's relatable like we feel alone in our seriousness like how many times do i speak to leaders and high achievers that are accomplishing amazing things and they tell me about I feel like an imposter or like others have it, like others have their stuff together and I don't. And it's like, please believe me. No, you're not like, nobody is better than you or worse than you. Everybody has their dark sides or dark thoughts. But because we have this facade around us, then we, we believe that we're the only ones. And that is anti-connection because I don't want to open up to you because I don't want you to see that sometimes I doubt myself or, you know, I didn't sleep last night because I was afraid of, you know, what would happen in this presentation. Or mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I had a, a difficult conversation and I'm just ruminating of what I should have said and so on. I don't want to open up about it. So we feel alone in that. Humor, play, it opens up connection. And with connection, well, especially in teams, it's better communication, better collaboration, better performance. And, but yes. I think that, yeah, the, the challenge, the challenge with humor, and I'll tell you my own story because because I think it relates, um, is that one people might not think that they're funny and be and and they might not think they're funny or can be funny because they've been trained to be serious all their life, so they don't think they have it, but mm -hmm. they do. I mean, some of the people I know who actually took improv classes in New York City, mm -hmm. it made a huge. And I don't like I don't like the word to get huge, but I'm going to say huge in this case. Um, made a really, really big difference in their career and their ability to enjoy what they do by taking an improv class. Mm -hmm. Because 
humor is a way to connect with people in a in a relaxed way. When you start laughing, and I think you and I share some commonality and and being obsessed with human behavior, particularly the brain, there's actually physical benefits to laughing. Of course. Right? You're, you, they're physical benefits. You don't need to take drugs. If you laugh, you're going to feel great. Something makes you laugh. Mm -hmm. So I think people are afraid to go there because they either th don't think they're funny because they're too serious because they're being told they have to be serious to be successful. Mm -hmm. uh, or they're afraid that if, if no one's going to laugh their joke, it's going to be a failure. It's going to be a disappointment, right? It, mm -hmm. It's the need to always perform. And if I'm telling a joke and nobody's laughing, oh my God, I'm a failure. Um, where in reality, and I wanted to go back and talk about your technique and how do you get past this? Because this is what you deal with. It could be a multi-million dollar successful business owner, and it could be a team leader, and it could be just somebody that works for a living and it's just not happy bringing them out of their whatever condition they're in through humor and comedy uh, is a way to drop your guard. You know, it's just, but you can't be funny unless you first make laugh, make fun of yourself and just, just, you know, just, it's almost like meditation. You take a deep breath in and then you let it out. That the, the hot piece is just go have fun. Okay. Who cares? So, Here's my personal story. So it was about maybe seven years ago, I was doing the CrossFit crazy fitness thing. And it was one hour, 10 of us go into a room with 10 stations and it's pretty intense. And you go boom, 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 boom. And I'm always making people laugh wherever I go. And, and at some point, one of the women that was trained me said, you know, you're really funny. You should go do this. There's a once a year, there's a, a contest in New York City called the Funniest Jewish Comedian, right? And of course, I'm Jewish. I'm from Israel. I said, you should go and do this. And I said, no, no, I'm not that kind of funny. I'm funny intuitively. We speak and I'm like the one liners. And that's not my thing. No, 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 you should do it. And just the thought of getting on stage and trying to be funny scared the crap out of me. And I've been, I've been a jokester all my life. And so because it scared me so much, I said, then I'm going to do it. And so I applied. And then, you know, the people that want to just have, you have to bring 20 of your friends to this comedy club. And I prepare for three months. This is prepared. So you have three minutes to do your, your little Wicom shtick. Uh, I remember doing it, throwing it out, doing it, throwing it out. No, that's not funny. That's not funny. That's not funny. And I got to two weeks before and I said, well, at some point I need to just prepare. So I settled on my little routine and, um, my wife is the one person in the world that doesn't think I'm funny at all. So she didn't even go. And so I took my kids and, and their friends and cousins and we went. Um, and, and I have to say, I mean, there were maybe 70 people in there. Um, it, was, it was frightening to get up on stage. And first of all, I, I thought that I would not remember anything I prepared. I think as soon as I walk in, I'm just going to completely forget everything that was my biggest fear um but i decided that my best way to deal with that fear was to deal with the fear with the first thing i was going to say on stage and what i said to everyone was did anybody see or hear anything about a recall which is an american term like if a product fails you know the government tells the company to pull it off the shelves i said did anybody hear about a recall for adult diapers? Because I'm scared shitless. I'm wearing one right now. And I hope there wasn't a recall. And they all started laughing. And I somehow got through this. Um, long story short, um, out of the four comedians that were in my, my section, one guy didn't show up. One guy came in early and got so drunk, they threw him out. So there were, there were maybe just three of us. And I was the one... I, I went last, which was great for me because I don't like to go first. So at the end, uh, this is what my my kids told me. I said, Dad, you weren't that funny, but you were funnier than the rest of them. And please don't do this again, right? <laughs> so um, Don't embarrass us again. <laughs> no, it, well, it, they said I was funnier than the rest of them, but but I wasn't that funny, right? And, you know, your family are your biggest critic. Um, anyway, um we're talking about you using 
comedy and, and being funny mm -hmm. to overcome performance challenges, the fact that people within teams um, can't find a way to get out of their own way, which is probably the best way I can, I can put it. Um, so you were, you were trained or you got a certificate from nobles, right? Uh, I forgot. I think there's something in your, in your LinkedIn. I have it on my side. Uh, and their motto, motto was fortune devours, fortune favors the prepared mind. Mm. Noble Manhattan, maybe. Yeah, Noble mm. Manhattan. That's right. I mean, I was thrown off because it said Manhattan, but it's actually in. Yeah, <laughs> in, in no, it has nothing to do with New York. Yeah, not to do with New York. Yeah. So, so yeah. fortune favors the prepared mind. Mm. So that's sort of like a, a coaching thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think what you do is you take the prepared mind, prepared to be boring and follow the routine, and then trying to achieve performance and be miserable in the process. You take that and you break it out through comedy. Is that a, is that a good way to describe what you do? That's so interesting that uh, I, I really appreciate your perspective on that. Um, I think that a prepared mind is prepared in any, can be prepared in different ways, right? The mm -hmm. way that I help people, let's say, prepare their mind is a little bit, as you say, is to actually, first of all, understand their mind, right? If there was one message that I wish everybody would know is that your thoughts are not the truth. So that you can understand that, therefore you can manage your mind. And second, that you can manage your mind in difficult situations. That we're going back to improv, what you mentioned. Like if, if you see, you know, behind me, there's a yes and, which is a concept that I used that I use a lot in what I talk about. Like whether it's with teams or with uh, with yourself or with in conversations, it's the number one pillar of improv comedy. And this is about co-creation. It's, it's, it's an, an amazingly potent tool for co-creation. And in order to do that, in order to use a yes answer in a nutshell, yes, it's about accepting what's, uh, what's in front of you, whether it's somebody in a conversation, whether it's circumstances in life, whether it's uh, an offer on an improv stage, right? And it's adding to it, building on it, uh, building from there. Doesn't mean accepting everything that's happening and just, and just, you know, doing what everybody wants. No, no. It's actually accepting the reality as is without judgment and being able to adapt um, and to build from it instead of denying, instead of being stuck in the, but this is not happening or, but this is not right or, but this should be different, right? Um, and in order to do that, we need to let go of, yes, of, of needing that needing to be right or needing to be rigid because guess what? You know, as a productivity coach, I teach people to plan because I think it's very important, but I also teach them that the plan will go out the window. So you need to be ready to yes and. You need to be ready to improvise, right? So there's kind of this, this, this dance between those two type of minds, which I don't think that's living in, in, in improvisation all the time is productive because then you're just reacting to everything. You need to have a focus. The planning everything and sticking and being rigid to your planning is all, I mean, won't help you because your plan will fail. Let's just, let's just be honest about that, right? So how can we actually find it too? So if we go back to the prepared mind, is a mind that is prepared to understand where it will fail and therefore set the conditions so that we can move forward toward that. Now, again, going back to comedy, I love that you, I, I love that you uh, mentioned that in order to be, you know, I don't teach people to make jokes. Uh, this, is not, this is not what I do uh, because... You know that it can be funny. It can be not funny, but as you said, if you if you understand yourself and you take yourself less seriously, and you are able to accept all parts of yourself and in success and in failure, and learn from that, then you're much more likely to do the same with others, and therefore to be able to collaborate better with others and to deal with her with life and so on. So these tools of improv and being able to laugh at yourself and laugh at situations and, and therefore being vulnerable and, and yet still, and, and, and yet solid in, in what you believe in because you're clear, all of this 
helps you perform in a way that doesn't come so much from is not fuel so much from stress it's it's more fuel mm-hmm. than just being yourself so, so, so there's a lot of layers behind that <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I mean, look, this is, um, I, I was kind of like debating whether this conversation, it, to take the, the fun part of the conversation and get us to tell not jokes, but to just be funny or to stick to really the essence of your work, because what you do is unique. There, there are plenty of coaches out there. There's plenty of people who are ready to fix whatever's wrong with you, but the very few people take that approach well let's fix it through joy through comedy through the fun stuff right and and i think back to my first question what problem are you solving mm-hmm. is i think you're solving the problem of people just way too serious and that is their biggest hindrance to anything they want to achieve in life they just way too damn serious mostly not to their fault because of it's upbringing and environments that and if you can get them to to break away, to break free from that and and discover the things that come with comedy, which is making fun of yourself and and just saying things out of left field that they're just funny and they say, wait a minute, but this was a really serious meeting. You know how many times I was after a meeting, I was called by my boss and said, you know, this was a very serious meeting. And then you, when you're joking around, it really interrupts things. And I said, no, you're wrong. I'm breaking the tension of the serious meeting, which allows people an opportunity to take a breather, right? And relax for a minute. And when people are relaxed, the conversation is way more productive than when everybody feels that they need to perform. So so I'd like to, yes, I like to yes and that, because I think that what you mentioned is the humor part, the fun part, is it really about doing a joke, making a joke that everybody will laugh at, or is it actually about creating an environment where people feel relaxed to be themselves, to feel relaxed, to, um, uh, to be able to crack a joke if, if they need to, or to be able to take a risk and, and jump in with an innovative idea or to, to suggest something uh, or to, again, to, to, to fail. Right. And, and because it's necessary. Right. We, we, we I know that it is the, the big F word, which is, oh, no, I want everything to be perfect. Well, that's not going to happen. Um, so uh, so creating that atmosphere is. Is is, is much more productive in, the, you know, I think that the thing of like we're too serious. I don't think that it's necessarily negative to be serious, but it's it's just it's just what is sustainable. Right. Like we need to find the balance when we're always too serious, when we're always in the should, I should do more, I should do better, this should be like this, this should be like that. Then it's 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 not it's not sustainable. When we find the like, how do we create an atmosphere to actually foster performance, to foster productivity, to foster that people feel better and safe and then we're getting better results. And sometimes it comes out, out of a haha joke. And sometimes it's just about being comfortable to, you know, have that camaraderie between people. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and again, th- these are the conditions that creates that healthy performance more than like really mm-hmm. forcing it of like, you should meditate right now for two hours. You should laugh. <laughs> you should, you should, um, you should. Yeah, yeah, and and when you tell somebody they should, they just do just the opposite because that's that's what we do as human beings, right? We we don't like to be told what to do to a great extent, even though our entire life we were told to do things a certain way if you want to be successful, and then we fight when somebody tells us what we should do. Yeah, but then we but we do it anyway. So I think that the the issue is that each one of us is individual with our own unique way, how we are wired and how we think and who we are. Mm-hmm. And, and the danger is that we, we sell our soul for some intangible price of success and performance that is rarely achieved because it's a moving target. Okay. So I, I wanted to perform and I got to this. Now what? Now what? Well, if you actually look at athletes, which is really the the true performance metric, right? Real athletes compete with themselves. And and if you want to do a four-minute mile 
and you actually do a four minute mile, the story doesn't end. The next story is I want to do a three minute and 40 second mile, right? And that's not necessarily a stressful thing to do. It's just achieving for the sake of feeling great that you're productive and you're creative and you're able to overcome things and get to a point. Um, very different than the universe that you operate in and to some extent as a business coach that I operate in, which is the dynamics of companies, of there's a boss and there's leaders and there's people that work there. Um, and most of the time it's broken because it's still, it's too serious and, and everybody lives to KPIs and everything is about performance as in numbers uh, and people just give of, give up on themselves in, in this, this nonstop chase of making the goals that somebody set for them, right? Instead of, yeah, I can do this, but let me do it my way so I can be happy when I get there. You said something so, so true there is that the goals that other people have set for them. And, you know, again, depending on the environment, sometimes some other people need to set goals and, and that's okay. But it's just that and you've seen that as a coach, I'm sure, and as a business, you know, coaching business owners for sure. Most people don't ask themselves, what do I want? Mm -hmm. And again, we live according to the version of success, as you said, that somebody said, for, like, again, uh, our, our parents, society, and so on. And that actually through productivity coaching has shown up in, in, in many cases where I've... I've coached people that say like, oh, I want to be more productive and so on. And when we look at really what's behind that, how they want to spend their time, what is most important uh, in their role and for them and, and, and what do they value and how do they prioritize how they focus their time? Sometimes we get back to the really core of why they're doing what they're doing. And sometimes that reveals like, oh, this is not about productivity. This is actually, I don't want to be a VP. I'm not interested in doing that, right? But I worked so hard to be here, right? I like climbed the wrong ladder type of like, it's a typical story, but that happens a lot. And when we ask ourselves, again, coming back to when we're, we get comfortable with ourselves, that we're able to manage our mind, we're able to, to understand ourselves um, and which requires a lot of vulnerability and requires a lot of, of, of looking inside and laughing at ourselves then we can better direct ourselves to what brings us that that joy because you know we'll we'll never be like truly truly peacefully happy doing something that that like chasing the the wrong thing and it's not so much what we're doing every day it's more about the, the, the life that we live in according to what values we live our life. And we're mm -hmm. going into deep, deep stuff. But I've yeah. seen that a lot. I've seen that a lot. And I'm sure you've seen it a lot too. And and so and a lot of times it's it's the it's the language, right? It's the words that we use to describe the stuff. So we we kept using the word productivity, right? You keep mm -hmm. saying it. For me, productivity on an individual level is meaningless. I think for me, and that's how I uh, I work with my clients and when I was in graduate school professor that's how I was teaching my students that it's not productivity on individual level. is it making a difference are you able to make a difference and mm. you find a way to, find any way you want to make a difference right if you want to be if you want to do nothing all day but do one thing that made a difference you should re you would really feel great about it but productivity mm -hmm. from a corporate standpoint from the business perspective it absolutely sucks because that means is did you get through your to-do list? Did you get to inbox zero? Uh, and, and I've actually, because I'm I'm a small business, family-owned specialist, that's been my lane. So I love to be. The, the family-owned businesses, the owners, some of them still live in, a, in, in the 18th century, the way they run their companies. And they're multimillionaires, by the way. And for them, productivity means I'm paying Genevieve $50,000 a year and I want to squeeze every dollar out of her. From the moment she walks through the, through the door of the office until she walks away. That's why those people completely freak out about remote work because I can't, I can't watch what you do. And therefore, how do I know you're productive? Uh, but in essence, it's just the opposite that, that happens. And, and it's, their, it's their 
cognitive bias that stops them from recognizing that when you have an employee that works at home, if you actually do this the right way, they will be five times more productive than it could ever be in an office because they they get to work at their own pace, gauge their, their own productivity and their accomplishments without somebody hovering, watching over them. And it's a much more relaxed environment to actually do work that matters. That's really the key. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, someone that, and I'm not going to mention his name because I'm actually incredibly honored and excited that someone who is a, I've been following him for five, six years. He is really one of the biggest deals in performance coaching. And he's going to be on my show in a few weeks. And uh, I'm not going to release his, his name. It's a he. Um, but he said, if you listen to him, and I've listened to him for hours and hours and hours, that our clients don't really give a shit about our certification, like whatever coaching certificate is. No one cares about that. What our clients care about, what your clients care about, because what you offer them is an opportunity to, to, get, to get out of their own way and find happiness in whatever they do, right? Through joy, right? They don't care about the certificate. They care about your ability to connect with them and, and make a difference, right? In a way that, look, everyone that you work with and everybody that I work with have tried every single thing that we can think of before. And 95% of the time, the stuff doesn't work. And... 95% of the time, it didn't work, not because the, the system isn't good, it's because human beings are lazy. They try something, they don't give it enough time to, to work, and then they walk away and they said, okay, let me find something better. So I, I was curious from, from your work with people through comedy and, and helping them get out, I'm, I'm using that term, get out of your own way by, by finding humor and laughter and joy in what you do. Can you think of a, of a story where it was really challenging and you were able to make a big difference through your style of work? And I know I'm setting you up because I don't share my questions with people ahead of my podcast because I want it to be raw and intimate. Um, if something comes to mind quickly, that's fine. If not, it's not a big deal. Um, your, like your biggest success story in, in, in what you do today. I would say that my biggest success story, I think that I have, like, as a coach, I think that this is difficult to measure that because I think that the work you do with people is helping them to think differently, which has ripple effects over a very long period of time. And oftentimes, I think we don't get to know that. So when you say that, I'm thinking of, like I'm thinking of clients that have changed their way of thinking and therefore, you know, uh, because that's what I, that's actually what I want. I want, I want them to think in a way that is more helpful for them so that they can manage their life and their time better so that they can feel better and, and, and have a, a better life experience and, and just wake up and be excited about what they do. And, um, you know, here, here's a small example of a one-on-one, -on -one, um, one-on-one uh, -on -one client um, who is a superstar like she is a founder and she is a mom and she is amazing and she works so hard she's such an amazing woman and um you know like many people she was waking up at night in panic right panic attacks at night and 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 because she was thinking of everything she had to do she was thinking of 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 all the things that she didn't do and, and so on. And what we did, and this is a technique that I, I really like to do is to, um, is to identify, you know, her negative thoughts and then create characters, all of them out of them and, and give them funny names. Right. So for example, one of my negative voice, she's called bitchy Sally. And uh, uh, bitchy Sally is, uh, you know, is an over like she's the one who says this should like or or worse, like she tells me like, no, nobody likes you. And, 
you know, uh, you're going to die in the streets alone with dead skin on your feet for rats to eat. Like, like she is brutal. Right. And by identifying those, those different, like, let's say voices that again, have, you know, have their roots and all that stuff. But first of all, we can uh, take distance from those and therefore identify them, therefore deal with them. So by, by doing that, and again, looking at our negative thoughts in a humorous way, right? We could neutralize that a little bit, neutralize the seri seriousness of it. And, um, and she, could, she was able to actually manage her negative thoughts and therefore stop waking up at night and panic. And I say this like this, and, and I, it seems like something small, but it's like it can be life changing for people to actually doing that. And so that, that's an example of how mm -hmm. you, using a humorous twist on personal development can make a big effect. Yeah. And, and just to kind of bring this to, to summary, I think that culture has a lot to do with it. And lucky you, you, I don't know how many of your clients are in the US, but the American culture uh, is too rigid. As much as we think we're not, it's too rigid. And all this political correctiveness of you can't say this and you know you have to put on your LinkedIn, you know, he and him, because otherwise it, it might be misinterpreted as you know what I'm talking about. It's um but with, with humor and comedy, you basically take all that stuff and you toss it out the window and you say, screw that, okay? Let's have fun. Let's pretend we live in a world with no rules and no political correctness and all these, these lines that we can't cross and not cross. And if you cross it, what does it really say about you? All this crap that politicians created for us that make life miserable. And just, just be yourself, okay? It's okay, it's fine. It, if I said something the wrong way, it's not because I hate gay people. It's because I try to be funny and it doesn't mean anything, right? And it's not that I'm making fun of gay people. I'm just saying everything is so always interpreted here as as it relates to, oh, you're supposed to say it. You're not supposed to say it. You know, if you say it this way, said it. just stop. You know, I, I there's somebody who wrote, uh, wrote a book and I, I forgot the title, but I know you're going to like it. There's all these negative thoughts everything that's going on in this this amazing piece of our of our body the brain uh it's like prison we're in prison he wrote a book and i think it was called prison break your ability to take over and conquer your negative thinking is actually prison break get open the door and get out of prison um and if you do this through comedy and and just being able to just you know it's Life's too short. Just have fun. Okay. It's it's okay. Um, it's interesting. I used to tell my teams who are complaining, <clears throat> talk about bitching, you know, always complaining about how much work there is and the phones are ringing and blah, 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 blah. And, and when I started to, when I put my parents in assisted living in a nursing home, I always just tell them, you know, you know what? Stop bitching. Do yourself a favor. Tomorrow is Saturday. Give up two hours of your day. Go find a nursing home locally somewhere. And go to the nursing home and walk up and down hallways, okay? And look at the people there. That's a coming attraction for your life, okay? You're going to sit there in a diaper and miserable and drooling, not remember anything. Walk through the hallways, go to the nursing home and take a big whiff of that urine smell that greets you when you go into a nursing home. And I promise you, when you come out, you're going to stop bitching. So, you know, the life is short, have fun. Yeah, it, it it does make sense, right? You never know what's going to happen. So last question before we go to some couple of rapid ones. Looking back at what you do, mm -hmm. what is, what's the biggest lesson you've learned from working with people through that lane of comedy and joy? What's the biggest advice you can give people who are Almost everybody, right? Challenged with being too serious, uh, too many to-do lists, not being productive, going yeah. between depression and tension and anxiety. Mm. Yeah. I'm going to repeat myself because that's one that is huge and I think it could change your lives, but your thoughts, they're fucking with you. They're not real. <laughs> 
So once you are able to discern that, um, it can absolutely change your life because Cheryl in marketing, she can wait. And the, the, if you say no to that Zoom meeting, nobody will die. And um, if you decide to leave work early and that's okay too. And I'm telling you, it's not like what a lot of the things that we, there's a lot of internal external pressure, but if we learn to deal with our internal pressure, the external pressure can, we you can deal with it. So don't believe everything you think. There you go. All right. So a couple of rapid questions so we can wrap this up. Um, Start. One person that influenced your life, not business. Yeah, I was really wondering about that. One person that influenced my life um, rapidly. Okay, I'll let's just I'll just go with the first that comes. India Ari, I love her music and uh, her. When I first moved to China, uh, her music really helped me to go through the discomfort of um, being there best advice you've ever received um other people are going to change so either you adapt or you leave because you're a singer um mm -hmm. what song will you admit to singing in the shower that might other people might find embarrassing oh anything aretha franklin yeah wow okay um okay so last one if you had a billboard in times square in manhattan that giant thing and genevieve pepin could mm. write something on it for yeah you see what would it say yeah it would be a huge picture of me pointing at you saying your thoughts are fucking with you that's what <laughs> i would say <laughs> okay well amazing so um I'm going to, this is going to be now running through my head my entire day that my thoughts are fucking with me. Yeah. Usually, usually when, when we use curse words, I always tell people, if you have kids in a room, let them go. But I don't think anybody listens to my show with kids in a room. It's usually walk, going for a walk, driving. Yeah. And again, my thing is my podcasts are an hour, an hour plus, because I, I didn't want to compromise and squeeze it into 30 minutes because people always say, Oh my God, it's an hour. And I don't know. You know, I'm very busy. I, by the way, that's another one of these absolutely words that I I hate that word. I despise that word. The word busy, busy. Mm. is is the root of all evil within everything we talked about when it comes to productivity. So when I work with clients and say I want our people to be busy, and I said, stop. It's a four-letter word that I hate, and nobody should ever say busy is the root of all evil because people think that they're getting paid to be busy or to pretend to be busy. It has nothing to do with being busy. It's about being productive. Absolutely. But more than that, more than that, what are you doing with your time that allows you to use your creativity, your God-given talent, yeah. your training, your education to make a difference? And that's what I was telling my MBA students and that's when I tell teams of my clients when I work with them. Yeah. Once a day, you have a unique opportunity to actually realign your, your life. When you brush your teeth at night in the bathroom, it's you and you and the toothbrush. Ask yourself two simple questions. One, have I made a difference in someone else's life today? In any shape or form, it doesn't have to be a big difference. It could be little thing that I learned from somebody, I don't remember who, go through your phone list, go through your contact list, find somebody that you haven't spoken with in a while and randomly send them a text, an SMS. Hey, just ran into your name. I haven't talked to you in a while. I hope everything's okay. That's it, okay? Random act of kindness, little thing. It's great. And the other piece was, did I make a difference? And was I productive today? As in, did I make a difference in the way I work? the way my impact of my work and if the answer to both question before you go to sleep is yes and yes then put a big smile on your, on your face go to sleep and start snoring and have fun and if the answer is no at least before you go to bed commit to doing something different tomorrow that's going to allow you to say yes tomorrow night when you brush your teeth right 
And at the end of the day, that's what it's about, right? It's about making a difference. Um, you are doing it by breaking barriers and allowing people to discover parts of them that are probably they doubt exist. But it's okay to say fucking on my podcast and it's okay to say fucking in so Zoom. and it's okay to say no to Zoom. And it's okay to say, you know what? You're boring me. I'm going to go go find something interesting. It's fine. So Genevieve, thank you so much. I think we'll do a part two of this at some point because there's so much more that we can. I agree. Into, I'm just like, yeah, let's actually and, and talk about way, productivity. Yeah, this we want to. We can talk about coaching after my incredible guest is going to show up because coaching to me is a is an incredible discipline. But there was a, I think you're part of a coaching masters. Some 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 of the companies that I. I looked at, so there's a Coaching Masters Summit 2023 in one of the groups that you're part of, and they have a picture of all these coaches. And you know what I did? I counted the number of people in the photo. And these are coaches, life coaches, whatever. Yeah. I counted the number of people, and there were probably 25 of them in the photo. <laughs> How many people were actually smiling? And to me, a smile is you get to see your teeth, not like uh -huh. one of these, right? Six, six out of um, these damn coaches were smiling. If you want your clients to be happy and to get a feeling of production, of, of productivity and happiness and conquer their challenges as a coach, dude, you need to smile. You need, to, you need people to look at you and say, wow, what a beautiful smile. This is somebody I want to talk to. So so that's what, I, I, I think to take your words, I think that Mo and that's also part of the problem that I saw was that I think that most coaches take themselves way too seriously. Most people take all yeah. of this way too seriously, or they they too serious about it, and it's it yeah. disconnects. And, and that's the problem that that good coaches like you and me face. And when I unpack it with my guests in a few weeks after that, I, we can talk again. But I think the issue the coaching is brilliant. The problem is. It's too easy to become a coach and not everyone should be a coach. There's a certain type of people that should be allowed to coach and 90% of them should not. I don't care about your certificate. I don't care if it's at the National Coaching Federation or the Tony Robbins coaching thing. It doesn't matter. There's some basic ingredients that allow people to be really good coaches. And... If you're not smiling in a picture as a coach, then to me, you're way too serious. You're just like a therapist sitting with a yellow pad and saying, Genevieve, how was your day? Oh, my day was terrible. You know, my, my, da, 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 da. oh, oh, how do you feel about that? I just told you how I feel about it. Oh, I'm sorry. Our time is up. Good luck. I'll see you next week and we'll talk about the same thing. So, yeah, um, you're right. The whole we can unpack what coaching is, what is effective coaching. And why most people should not be coaching because they're not set up to be a coach. So yeah, that's there's it. a lot there. Well, um, sorry, ended Stay on tuned. that note. Stay tuned for more. Javiv, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Contact <laughs> thank you. Javiv. Your information will be on my show notes. I don't actually transcribe the show. Uh, and I don't do timestamps because I want people to listen. I don't want people to cheat and jump to what did Genevieve say about that? But your contact info will be there. If you want to find Genevieve on LinkedIn, if you can spell the word Genevieve, you will find her. Yeah. That's or it. look, joy not stress. Joy, joy not, not stress. St there you go. No pills required. It's just talking, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. As no in, pills required. Yeah. yeah. That's Come in and be willing to laugh. I have a lot of silly videos on my LinkedIn page. So if you're open to that, you'll see. Oh, you'll right. see. <laughs> you'll see. You'll hear. All right. Thank you so much. It's been great. Thank you so much, Zev.